Hello everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast characterizing the performance of qPCR instruments, approaches for assessment and comparison. I'm Brenda Kelly Kim of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Douglas Scientific. Douglas Scientific LLC is a rapidly growing laboratory automation company located in Alexandria, Minnesota, with a team of over 100 professionals bringing together expertise in engineering, biosciences, automation, motion control, and other fields. Core to the Douglas Scientific mission is a dedication to making the world a better place by delivering innovative laboratory automation. For more information, please visit www.douglasscientific.com. We have a few announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. And we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. Before we begin, I would like to let our audience know that you will soon see a poll question popping up on your screen. If you could take a moment to answer this poll question so that we can improve the content we bring you, we would really appreciate it. I would now like to introduce today's speakers. Ross Higgins and Michael Kubista. Ross Higgins is a business development executive with Douglas Scientific and serves in several capacities related to the development, introduction, and growing adoption of the new IntelliCube system for qPCR applications. Before joining the company, Ross worked within the clinical diagnostics field and was responsible for oversight of the molecular testing laboratory at a rapidly growing cap accredited startup reference laboratory. In the role, Ross and his team developed and validated new workflows and test methods that led to unprecedented throughput capacity and cost reductions. Ross has a BS in clinical laboratory science and an MBA from Virginia Commonwealth University and maintains an ASCP certification as a medical laboratory scientist. Dr. Kubista is the founder and CCO of the TATAA BioCenter www.tataa.com and head of the Department of Gene Expression at the Institute of Biotechnology at the Czech Academy of Sciences. He was one of the pioneers contributing to the development of quantitative real-time PCR, qPCR, and introduced qPCR for single cell expression profiling. He led the development of reagents for high throughput single cell expression profiling and quality control. He also developed a qPCR tomography for intracellular expression profiling. Dr. Kubista co-authored the minimum information for publication of quantitative real-time PCR experiments, MIQE, guidelines, and is a member of the CEN and ISO workgroups drafting the forthcoming technical specifications and guidelines on the pre-analytical processes in molecular diagnosis, diagnostics. I will now turn it over to Ross Higgins for his presentation. Thank you, Brenda. Um, I'd like to begin by once again welcoming everyone to today's special webinar presentation on the performance characterization of qPCR instruments. Again, my name is Ross Higgins, and on behalf of the entire team here at Douglas Scientific, thank you again for joining us today. For those of you who may not be entirely familiar with Douglas Scientific, we are a small but also rapidly growing laboratory automation and consumable company. And as Brenda mentioned, core to our business and our mission is a dedication to making the world a better place through the delivery of innovative laboratory automation solutions that enable the advancement of biomolecular research at not only higher speeds but also fractional cost. And our history in the PCR space really began with the array tape consumable, which is a unique product that can be used as a replacement to PCR plates and micro titer plates. And due to the continuous nature of array tape as compared to a traditional micro titer plate, it is very well suited for inline processing. 
and subsequently delivers a total paradigm shift compared to plate-based processing methods that you might be familiar with. And when combined with our robust automation instrument platforms, the array tape enables complete elimination of manual processing in your lab and subsequently will allow for an increase in throughput, reduction in labor cost, and a minimization of potential for human error in your processing. And the unique design of array tape provides a notable characteristic of supporting very highly miniaturized PCR reactions as compared to microtiter plates. And this reduces both your reagent and your sample use, as well as the total consumable cost of running these assays in your laboratory. And our newest product, the IntelliCube, was recently launched earlier this year and advances all of these benefits to include a fully integrated PCR workflow that provides for extreme laboratory efficiency. And we see IntelliCube as the next evolution of our array tape platform and fully integrating liquid handling, amplification, detection, and data analysis steps associated with a typical PCR workflow, all into a single laboratory system supporting real-time PCR with the array tape consumable. And as I mentioned, IntelliCube has been designed as a fully integrated system. Users simply start by programming their samples and assays using our intuitive software. And then the technician loads those DNA samples and their assay plates, which would contain PCR reagents, onto the instrument itself. And from there, the run or the protocol is activated through a touchscreen interface on the instrument. And the rest of the process is fully automated for true walkaway automation. Typically, it begins by loading 800 nanoliters of each sample and assay into the reaction wells within a given segment of array tape. This combines to create a total of a 1.6 microliter PCR reaction, which is then sealed and the array itself is moved into the integrated PCR station on the instrument for thermal cycling. Excellent block performance ensures minimal well-to-well -well variation in your PCR reactions across the array. And as the block goes through each PCR cycle, the dyes are excited through LEDs on the instrument, and the real-time fluorescence is monitored through an onboard CCD camera in the system. And I think users will find that the IntelliCube will support nearly any of the commonly used PCR probes and fluorogenic dyes in a PCR reaction. As the instrument is completing a typical PCR protocol, users can either monitor the progress of their run in real time, or once the run is complete, our IntelliScore software will allow them to access their data and analyze or export to a LEMS system or a new, uh, another program such as GenX for downstream analysis. Introducing IntelliCube. The process begins with independent aspiration of the DNA sample and reagents from the respective source plates. Source plates can be randomly accessed through the plate stacker located on the instrument. The DNA samples are dispensed in up to 384 wells at one time with the Cybe Felix dispense pipette. Following sample dispensing into the array tape, reagents are loaded into the wells. The array is automatically sealed with a pressure sensitive seal prior to thermal cycling. In the meantime, integrated wash stations are used to clean the tips and provide stringent cleaning measures to mitigate the risk of cross-contamination between samples. A Peltier block facilitates the amplification and supports multiple array formats without block changes. Real-time fluorescence detection is supported with a high-resolution CCD camera and LED excitation source with five optic channels and the ability to multiplex data capture in 15 seconds or less. The IntelliX software supports protocol generation and subsequent data analysis of PCR results. Lab personnel can observe amplification curves on the instrument in real time. 
walk-away operation, increased efficiency of lab personnel, increased throughput, reduced chemistry costs, and reduced consumable costs. IntelliCube, your solution for the most efficient lab possible. So as you saw in the video, together with ArrayTape, the IntelliCube platform provides users a fully integrated system that eliminates error-prone workflows and complex automation. It provides flexibility for a range of throughput needs, different chemistry selections, as well as customizable dispensing patterns for various study designs. And perhaps most importantly, it provides both of these key benefits in an efficient and economical manner that will reduce labor and reagent use in your lab, allowing you to achieve the lowest possible operating cost for your qPCR workflows. And that brings me to the, the last topic that I've not really fully addressed yet, which is qPCR instrument performance. It's not hard to argue that very few platforms offer a combination of flexibility, low cost of operation, and high performance. Frequently, it seems like you might be left with an exercise of picking two of those, but not usually three. And performance may very well be the most difficult topic of all to address because of the many different parameters involved, and notably the lack of standardization between vendors, which makes it difficult to compare different instruments to each other. However, with the support of Michael Cubista and his colleagues at Tata, we've generated extensive performance data on the IntelliCube system. And it convinces me personally that the middle of this diagram could actually be occupied by a respectable new platform from Douglas Scientific. But the data will speak louder than words and certainly louder than me. So from here, I'd like to thank you for your attention as I welcome Michael Cubista. Michael will be discussing some of the important uh, per instrument performance parameters, as well as some practical approaches that can be used by your lab to assess and compare qPCR performance. Uh, thank you, Douglas, for the introduction. Uh, Tata Biocenter researchers have been working in the PCR field since 1991, starting out developing dyes and probes that become fluorescent upon binding DNA. In 1998, we founded the first company in Europe specialized in real-time PCR-based molecular diagnostics. And in 2001, the Tata Biocenters were founded. Our headquarter is in Gothenburg, Sweden. We are also present in Prague, Sobliken, and San Francisco. Working tight with leading instrument and solution providers, we have the best equipped laboratories for molecular analysis where we offer hands-on training. We are also one of Europe's leading providers of molecular services, and we are behind many of the quality control methods and tools currently on the market. Implications of poor quality control can be detrimental, as illustrated by a recent case in Germany. For over two years, German investigators were searching for a serial killer who, based on DNA evidence, was linked to six homicides. DNA test revealed the killer was female. Running through crime databases, the elusive killer was found active all around Germany and was also linked to 40 crimes, including common theft, car dealership, robbery, and school breaking. The suspect was eventually identified. It was a female technician from the production of the swabs. The cotton swabs used were not certified for DNA analysis. In 2002, a scientific report linked measles vaccine to autism. The supporting data were based on quantitative real-time PCR. The actual data are shown in the graph. To the left are positive standard samples, and to the right we see patient samples interpreted as positive by the investigator. The interpretation of the qPCR data was called into question by Dr. Stephen Buster, who appeared as expert witness for the defense in the United States on federal claims in Washington, D.C., when the vaccine producer was sued. The publication was retracted 
and the news were spread. But it was too late. People had lost confidence in the vaccine, leading to measles outbreak all across the world, sometimes even with deadly outcome. How could such questionable qPCR data end up in a prestigious journal, causing so much harm? This question was asked by Stephen Buston, who gathered a group of experts in the qPCR field, and together we wrote the Mikey guidelines. The Mikey guidelines request papers presenting qPCR results to provide validation data and sufficient information about the experiment for the reviewers to be able to assess the quality. Compliance with the Mikey guidelines is today requested by over 25 journals and recommended by many more. In diagnostics, quality requirements are even higher since treatment decisions may be based on the test results. In the diagnostic workflow, most of the issues leading to uncertainty, variability, and bias are introduced during the pre-analytical workflow rather than by the actual molecular analysis. This led the European Commission to launch the project SPEEDY under the coronation of CAGIN to standardize and improve the pre-analytical workflow. Objectives included identifying factors with impact on test results, and to develop technologies and tools to control the workflow and assess the quality of the material being tested. Speedia activities included proficiency ring trials. Samples were shared among participating laboratories across Europe that were instructed to prepare DNA or RNA using their standard operating procedures and return the purified nucleic acid to us for quality assessment. Out of more than 100 participating routine laboratories, 33% had at least two quality indicators out of range when analyzing RNA. Based on the problems identified and addressed in Spedia, the European Committee for Standardization, SEM, initiated in 2010 a program to develop technical specifications for the pre-analytical processing of samples that are about to be published. In 2014, the International Organization for Standardization, ISO, launched eight projects to address the pre analytical phase in molecular diagnostics. The forthcoming guidelines are related to the analysis of RNA in SNAP frozen tissue, the analysis of protein in SNAP frozen tissue, the analysis of DNA in FFP tissue, the analysis of RNA in FFP tissue the analysis of protein in FFP tissue, the analysis of RNA in blood sample, the analysis of genomic DNA in blood samples, and the analysis of cell-free DNA in blood. 37 countries participating in the ISO effort and an additional 20 countries are observing. This map indicates if the guidelines apply to your country. So, what have we learned from Spedia, Mikey, and from internal QC work? I will take you through how we assess the performance of new systems at Tata Biocenter. And as example, we will evaluate the IntelliQ from Douglas Scientific. The same procedure is used to evaluate the performance of any new diagnostic test, new assay, new reagent batches, and even when introducing a new technician. We start by testing the uniformity and repeatability of the system essentially validating that compatible results are obtained in all the wells of the instrument. We then evaluate the dynamic range, the efficiency and precision of the test. We evaluate the limit of quantification, which is the lowest amount of target that can be quantified. We also evaluate the limit of detection, which is the lowest amount of target that can be detected, but not necessarily quantified. Finally, we assess the resolution, which is the smallest concentration difference that can be measured. To test the performance, we need a test assay. The most popular test assay for this purpose is the valid plan, originally developed by Henrik Laurel at Toulouse University to measure and correct for residual genomic DNA and expression profiling studies. Valid prime is a highly optimized assay 
targeting a non-transcribed conserved sequence in the human genome that is present in exactly one copy per haploid genome. The valid prime is used with a genomic DNA standard calibrated against the National Institute of Standards and Technology Human Genomic DNA Standard Reference Material. Hence, working with valid prime, we determine the absolute number of human genomes in a test sample. In gene expression profiling, valid prime offers a smoother, more accurate, and much more cost-efficient workflow than RT-negative controls for compensation of genomic DNA background. It is critical replicate measurements generate same result. Any variation across replicate measurements confound the measured results and may limit the conclusions that can be made based on the analysis. Instrument companies usually specify the uniformity and repeatability of their instruments by the coefficient of variation, which is usually around 1%. This information has to be converted into something that can be measured and experimentally validated. If the specification is that the coefficient of variation shall be no more than 1% at cycle 25, this means the standard deviation of replicates shall be no more than 0.25 cycles. So, let's see how the IntelliQ performs. Filling the plate of the IntelliQ with replicates, quantifying genomic DNA with a valid prime assay, we can inspect and quantify the repeatability. As you see in this graph, the 768 replicate qPCR response curves are very tight. This is a frequency diagram showing the distribution of the CQ values across the 768 replicates. The data are analyzed with a QC tool in the software channels. The first test is for normality, which passes, meaning that the variation of CQ values across the replicates is normal distributed, which is expected. The standard deviation of the replicates is also calculated and is here 0.087 cycles. This is far below the 0 0.2, 0 0.25 cycles claimed by the majority of QPCR instrument providers. Do all instruments perform this well? Not really. This is an example from one of our regular QC controls at the Tata Biocenter. As you see, this test passes normality. However, the standard deviation is unacceptably high. It is 0.45 cycles. With this instrument, we would never be able to reliably measure small differences. We found a filter in this instrument was offset, which may have happened by somebody accidentally bouncing into it. The line in the filter, the instru instrument eventually performed well again. Notably, there was no message or any other indication from the instrument it was now performing. To discover the problem, we needed to perform the QC scan. This is another example of a malperforming qPCR instrument. This time, the standard deviation is within specifications, although just barely, it's 0.246. But inspecting the distribution of CQ values we see it is not normal. Rather, there are two peaks. This particular instrument had two heaters, one on each side of the block. The PLC air heating elements were not synchronized, resulting in a small temperature difference between the two sides of the block. This gave rise to a systematic difference in CQ values, and the B modal distribution was observed. Replacing the malfunctioning Peltier element, the instrument worked okay again. As with the previous example, there was no error message, and we might not have discovered the problem without performing the QC test. From experience, we have learned the importance of regularly validating the performance of all the QPC instruments we use. <clears throat> the valid prime, or rather genomic DNA, is not suitable template for evaluating dynamic range because we cannot work with high concentrations of the human genome due to viscosity issues. 
For this, we need a different test assay. We will use a synthetic double-stranded DNA template of 1,000 base pairs, alien sequence. This DNA spike is popular to test and optimize the performance of workflows as it reflects inhibition and yield. A static curve is constructed by analyzing standard samples containing between 0.5 and 40 million copies of the DNA spike. The standard samples are constructed by tenfold serial dilution of a calibrated stock. Inspecting the standard curve, we see the variation across replicates increases towards higher CQ, which corresponds to lower concentration. We also see that the lowest concentration CQs fall below the trend line, indicating a bias. This is even clearer in the residuals plot, which shows the deviation from the trend line as function of template concentration. At the lowest concentration, we have an average of only 0.4 molecules per reaction volume. So many of the replicates are negative, which is the reason for the bias. It is expected. Also, a larger spread and lower concentration is expected. This is due to a phenomenon known as sampling ambiguity. Consider a patient infected by influenza virus having a load of one viral molecule per milliliter of blood. If we collect one mil of blood from that patient, this particular mil may contain one viral molecule but it may also contain two, three, or perhaps even four. And there is also a distinct po a possibility the particular mill of blood collected contains no virus at all, and we obtain a negative test result. The probabilities for those outcomes are given by the Poisson distribution, which is depicted in this graph. The purple line indicates the probabilities for the example I just gave. The probability a sampling of one mil contains exactly one molecule when collected from a container with an average concentration of one molecule per mil is 37%. The probability it contains two molecules is 18% and it is 7% it contains three. The probability it is blank is also 37%. This variation across replicates due to sampling ambiguity give rise to the impression, to, to the imprecision in the quantification of low concentrated samples. From the Poisson distribution, we can calculate the theoretical limit of detection. This graph indicates the probability a sampling is positive as a function of target concentration in the container. From the graph follows, an average of three target molecules per volume analyzed is required to produce 95% positive reads. Hence, working at 95% confidence, the theoretical limit of detection due to sampling ambiguity is three molecules. Note, this limit of detection is independent of the measurement technology. The sampling ambiguity also contributes to the largest spread of replicates towards lower template concentration and as seen in this example. There is no generally agreed acceptable spread of replicates for quantification. It varies from case to case depending on the precision requested for the particular test. At Tata, unless we have other specifications, we request the relative standard deviation, also known as the coefficient of variation of the estimated concentrations to be less than 35%. The limit of quantification shall also be within the dynamic range of the test, and it cannot be below the limit of detection. This is the LOQ analysis of the DNA spike data. The lowest template concentration that falls below 35% relative standard deviation is 40 molecules. Hence, Hence, the quantification is at least 40 template molecules, but it is not as good as four, which is the concentration of the next standard point. This is again the standard curve of the DNA spike. 
This time, however, we have eliminated the concentrations below the LOQ, showing only the linear range. As you can see, in this range, the replicates are very tiny. From the slope of the standard curve, we estimate the PCR efficiency, which for this assay is 93.6%. Because of the very high reproducibility of the instrument and the large number of replicates that can be performed, the efficiency is determined with very high precision. The 95% confidence interval is 93.1 to 94%, which means we really know with very high accuracy the PCR efficiency of this assay, and we can make reliable corrections. The precision of the standard curve is reflected by the working hardening confidence band that indicates where the standard curve is expected to be with 95% confidence. The working hardening confidence band is indicated by red dashed lines, one on each side of the fitted standard curve shown with the blue line. Without enlarging the graph, you cannot distinguish the red and blue lines, indicating exceeding precision in the estimated standard curve. As mentioned before, with valid prime, we cannot produce standard curves covering a wide range of concentrations because of limitations working with genomic DNA. This valid prime standard curve therefore covers a narrower concentration range, but instead it is based on much smaller increments. The dilution in each step here is only twofold. Analyzing the spread of the replicates for the valid prime assay, we find the limit of quantification is 32 molecules or lower. With 16 molecules, the coefficient of variation of the estimated concentrations is just about 35%. So LOQ is somewhere between 16 and 32 molecules. These data can also be analyzed for the limit of detection. At low target concentrations, replicates become negative. This plot shows the fraction of negative calls versus concentration. Entering the graph, sorry, entering the graph at 95%, we read out the limit of detection to 2.95 molecules. As you recall, this is the theoretical limit of detection, meaning that confounding variation here is entirely due to the sampling ambiguity. Replotting the standard curve for the valid prime assay above the limit of quantification, we cover the range from 32 to 2048 molecules. From this plot, we estimate the PCR efficiency of the valid prime assay to 99.7%, with a 95% confidence of 98 to 102%. The somewhat wider confidence interval here compared to the analysis of the DNA spike is due to the narrower concentration range covered. Finally, we also test for a solution. Again, the valid prime assay was used, but this time half of the replicates had 50% higher concentration. In the plot, these are shown in blue color and are found at lower CQ. Additional plots show concentration differences of 30%, 25%, 20%, and 15%. As the concentration difference decreases, the blue and brown response curves move closer together. The resolution can be quantified as follows. The spread of CQs of the replicates at each of the two concentrations that are compared is plotted in a frequency diagram. A decision line <coughs> is drawn in between the two maxima that should distinguish between samples at the two concentrations. 
the number of replicates at each concentration that produce CQs on the wrong side of the decision line or misclassified based on the test. Working at 95% confidence, a maximum of 5% false calls is tolerated. This corresponds to a test specificity and test sensitivity or 95% or higher. So let's see how the measured data behave. With 50% difference in concentration, corresponding to a forward change of 1.5, we have complete separation of the replicates at the two concentrations. With 30% difference in concentrations, distributions move closer and there is some overlap. Specificity is now 98% and sensitivity is 99%. Specificity and sensitivity formally relates to the rates of positive and negative cases. Since we here compare two concentrations only, the naming is arbitrary. Moving to 25% difference, we have a specificity of 98% and a sensitivity of 100%. Continuing, to 20% difference, we have a specificity of 98% and a sensitivity of 97%. And at a concentration difference of 15%, we have a specificity of 98% and a sensitivity of 86%. The letter has more than 5% false calls, which means the resolution is not sufficient anymore to distinguish between the two concentrations. To summarize the results we have obtained in the validation study on the IntelliQ, using the valid prime and calibrated human genomic DNA, we have found the PCR efficiency of the valid prime assay run on the IntelliQ is 99.7% with a 95% confidence interval of 97.7 to 101.7%. The limit of detection of genomic DNA with a valid prime assay on the IntelliQ is three molecules, which corresponds to the theoretical limit due to sampling ambiguity. The limit of quantification of genomic DNA with a valid prime assay on the IntelliQ at 35% relative standard deviation is between 16 and 32 molecules. The resolution using the valid prime assay on the IntelliQ is sufficient to measure 20% difference in the concentration of genomic DNA. Using the DNA spike, we find the dynamic range is 40 to 40 million target molecules and the PCR efficiency is 93.4%. Note the impressive accuracy in the estimate of the PCR efficiency. The 95% confidence interval is 93% to 93.8%. All these analyses have been performed in compliance with the CLSI guidelines as implemented in the software GenX from AutoD. I have taken you through the standard procedure to assess a new system. In this case, the IntelliQ from Douglas Scientific. The same approach can be used to assess any new system, test kit, assay, or just to validate a new batch of reagent. If you're interested in learning more about the methods to design, optimize, and validate molecular analysis, you're welcome to join any of the Tata BioCenter hands-on courses we offer. I thank you for your attention, and we will be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Michael and Ross, for that excellent presentation. Before we get started on questions, I'd like to remind our audience just how they can submit their questions. You can submit questions by typing them into the Q&A box, which can be found, as I said, clicking on the green Q&A button on the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we have time for. Our first question is for Dr. Kubista. 
how did the performance characterization compare to other leading qPCR instruments? Interestingly, very few instrument uh, manufacturers share performance data on their instrument. The information in the specifications is usually very limited. And uh, of course, uh, uh, one can do it uh, internally. Uh, we do it, but to a certain extent. Uh, but uh, generally, the specifications of uh, most of the QPCR instruments is, as I indicated, a, a, a coefficient of variation of 1% for the repeatability which corresponds to standard deviations of 0.25 because this is typically specified at the 25 cycles. Recently, Roche launched uh, their new system uh, and uh, with a little better specification, which is 0.22 uh, standard deviation. So uh, the IntelliQ, at least in our hands, performs better than uh, at least those specifications. Then, of course, there are uh, systems uh, uh, for research that are not really commercial instruments where one can obtain even higher uh, repeatabilities, but uh, they are usually not bad available. Thank you. Our next question is for Ross Higgins. How difficult is it to optimize reactions for miniaturization? That's a, uh, that's a really good question. Um, it, I can say that it sort of varies a bit from assay to assay, but generally um, we don't encounter too many assays that require e extensive optimization. Um, but when we do, our scientific team does have some support capabilities to offer our customers to help get those finicky assays uh, tweaked for use in a, in a miniaturized format. And usually that can be pretty easily addressed by an adjustment in the primer probe concentration or sometimes in the temperature settings of the PCR profile itself. Thank you, Ross. And we have another question for you. Do the benefits of automating qPCR really outweigh the added costs? Yeah, I can say almost always, Brenda. Um, on the surface, lab automation is rarely thought of as, as bargain equipment. But when you factor in the benefits of removing human error from the process and the different gains in efficiency, it becomes quite clear that introducing laboratory automation is economically advantageous. Um, I can say the, the IntelliCube goes a step further than typical lab automation because we're we're reducing the reagent use as well, um, in addition to the efficiency in the process. So typically reactions may go down to less than 10 cents um, per, per individual PCR reaction. And in many cases, that huge savings justifies the investment of the equipment almost immediately. Thank you. Our next question for Michael this time from Dominic at University of Arizona. Are these results from technical replicates of the same sample run on different platforms? Uh, in, this, uh, in this particular case, uh, it was run on a single platform. Uh, usually uh, when one uh, performs tests on uh, reproducibility, one has to specify what kind of reproducibility is being tested. Uh, one can uh, test for inter-plate reproducibility, inter-run uh, reproducibility, inter-instrument reproducibility, inter-lab reproducibility. So it always has to be specified. But uh, th in this particular example is run on a single uh, instrument. Great. Question uh, next for Ross. Is there a high learning curve with this device as compared to others? Uh, 
Great question. Uh, I, I don't think we have uh, too much of a difference in our learning curve, although we are integrating liquid handling and PCR, a PCR system into the same unit. So it is a bit more of a complex unit than either of those systems in a standalone format, but it is extremely easy to use. We've designed the software around a very user-friendly and intuitive interface. And with our on-site training that's provided during the installation, as well as some additional training for advanced users that's offered at our company headquarters in Alexandria, Minnesota. Labs who adopt our equipment will be very well equipped for operating and troubleshooting the machine. Great. Our next question from James at Canaan Ministries. How often is the equipment QC, QA performed? Do you have specialized analytical software for the equipment? We do um, routine preventative maintenance plans, but we, we also work with individual labs to determine the maintenance schedule and the calibration schedule that is suitable for their particular application, as well as any regulatory requirements that might apply in that particular lab environment. Um, as far as software and tools, we, we have a set of different tools in our software that would be accessible to advanced users, as well as our service team to help in terms of the calibrations and, and uh, other instrument maintenance functions that might be needed over a period of time. Thank you. Our next question also for Ross. James from GSK asks, can it be used to quantify patient samples with very low viral loads? Yeah, and I, I think I might let Michael um, address this one as well. But yeah, by and large, um, the, the function of viral load testing in a small reaction format would be somewhat dependent upon the titers expected for that particular virus. So whenever you reduce your reaction volume, you are also going to be reducing the amount of copies that you're testing in that PCR reaction. Sometimes that's maybe handled by additional replicates. Um, but in some cases, the necessary sensitivity for a given assay wouldn't be a good candidate overall for miniaturization. And, and perhaps Michael can, can add some additional clarity to applications that, that would be suitable for miniaturization. Uh, well, uh, generally speaking, if you're only targeting uh, one uh, template uh, so, or, or one target, uh, then uh, essentially the bottleneck uh, will be uh, the concentration, uh, how to concentrate the material. And if there is a single molecule in that particular reaction chamber, you're going to detect it. If you're working with uh, uh, profiling issues that you're looking for uh, 20 or perhaps 90 targets in a single sample, and you have to divide that sample into aliquots. And usually those workflows require uh, pre-amplification of the material. And here, uh, the IntelliCube has quite an interesting advantage because it's a high throughput instrument, but it uses a little larger volumes than uh, uh, the uh, um, high throughput instruments that are really miniaturized, which means that the number of pre-amplification cycles required is smaller. So that, that's actually a, a pretty important advantage. Thank you for those answers. Our next question for Michael Kubista. Could you explain in more detail how you QC tests of the QPCR instruments were done? Uh, uh, the QC test. Oh, the QC test is done as follows. It's, uh, it's very, very important uh, when you QC that the variation you observe is really due to the instrument and not to the way you pipette uh, or mix your samples or any other factors that are not really relevant. So 
it's done a little differently on the IntelliCube than a conventional QPCR instrument, and that's because the IntelliCube has integrated liquid handling. So the QC test on the IntelliCube is actually testing the combined performance of the liquid handling and PCR, which is actually more challenging because on a regular QPCR instrument, the QC tests only the QPCR performance. So anyhow, uh, what you do is that uh, you work with a highly reproducible assay, very well working assay. Uh, you have uh, as large volumes as possible because that's not what you want to test for. And then uh, you uh, plate out your sample such that uh, all the wells contain exactly the same material. And uh, you just perform regular QPCR and you uh, analyze the variation of the CQ values. Typically, this should be uh, done such that the CQs appear around 20 and 25 cycles, which is where most instruments perform the best. So that's typically the standard procedure. Thank you for that answer. Our next question also, actually for Ross, will the reagents and consumables from Douglas Scientific be used on other vendor platforms or vice versa? Yes, so it depends a bit on, on which consumable we're, we're discussing. Um, we, we do have our array tape consumable for the PCR reactions. That's the vessel where the, the PCR reactions occur. That product uh, is distributed by Douglas Scientific. On the other hand, there are other consumables that might be used on the instrument, such as your sample plate or your assay plate or the uh, pipette tips that are used on the sample dispensing head. And those would be sourced from uh, a variety of other manufacturers. Thank you, Ross. Our next question, also for Ross, is question, does the instrument make the PCR mix, for example, a TACMAN reagent for CyberGreen? Typically, the lab operator will prepare a 2x reaction mix of their assays for a given protocol. And that would be loaded into the instrument in a plate format, or it could be in a, in a tube format, like matrix tubes. And essentially, the instrument will load 800 nanoliters of that reaction mixture, as well as 800 nanoliters of the sample, or the uh, nucleic acid template from the sample plate, to prepare a 1.6 microliter total reaction. Thank you, Ross. Another question for you, John from Internet Medicine asked, is there online support for this system? Absolutely. We, we have a online service portal that's accessible 24 hours a day and seven days a week. And we also have on-call phone support for customers who, who may have a question or an issue with the instrumentation. Great. Our next question for Dr. Kubista. Can you explain in more detail how he QC tests of the QPCR instruments were done? I, I think I've had that question before. Okay, great. Let's get to our next question. Are there certain applications for which miniaturization of PCR reactions is not suitable? Uh, indeed, uh, indeed there are, and uh, it actually relates to a question we had earlier about uh, uh, viral load uh, testing and uh, sensitivity. And as uh, <clears throat> Ross answered, uh, 
essentially you can only you can only detect what's in the tube uh, in the end and and of course if you miniaturize analyzing very very small volumes uh, that will be the bottleneck uh, in terms of sensitivity because you need to concentrate the original sample into uh, such a small volume and get the target in there so those miniaturized platforms, but I'm not really referring now to IntelliCube because IntelliCube is not miniaturized to the extent as some of the high throughput platforms uh, like the uh, uh, Open Array, the uh, Fluidine Biomark, the WaferChin, the Roche 1536. Uh, so uh, uh, that's essentially where the uh, miniaturized platform are not suitable. It's, it's for uh, sensitive missions. Great, thank you for that answer. Our next question also for uh, Michael. Viral mutation can occur fast and often. How is the instrument capable of correcting for HIV and other mutations? Yes, I, I think that uh, question might be best answered by Michael. Um, but, but my answer would be that that would need to be corrected on an assay basis rather than on an instrumentation basis. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the answer. Uh, it, it's it's an assay issue. It's not an instrument issue. Thank you. Our next question is for Ross. Do you think the liquid handling component of IntelliCube has made the added advantage for precision of pipetting replicates compared to other platforms, which increase the sensitivity? of resolution assay. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, as, as you might guess, anytime you have a manual process that is handled from uh, different users in the lab or different technicians, there's going to be inherent variability in their pipetting styles and techniques. Some technicians are, are exceedingly well with manual pipetting and can sometimes beat instruments. But on the other hand, there are technicians in the lab who are, are not as cautious with their technique and would have uh, CVs well beyond what you would wish to have in a, in a sensitive qPCR assay. And with the IntelliCube, the pipetting CVs are, are very tight, and we typically see CVs uh, less than 4%, but um, always less than 5% on the system. Great, thank you. I think that is all the time we have for questions. Um, I just wanna pass it back to um, Michael and Ross if they have any further or final thoughts for our audience. Thank you, Brenda, and thank you for all of you who have taken time from your schedules this afternoon, this morning, or this evening, depending on where you are to attend today's webinar and uh, we'd love to get in touch with you if you'd like any additional information. Uh, you're also welcome to visit our website, douglasscientific.com. Thank you for your time. Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you indeed. And uh, I, if there's something that you should bring home, I think, from this seminar is the importance of actually testing and validating your particular instrument and your particular say, it's not that difficult, it's not expensive, uh, there are tools to do it, now you also learned how to do it. Uh, and uh, uh, trust me, uh, you will find that uh, some of your instruments may not be performing as well as the instrument manufacturers claim or as you actually think they perform. 
So thank you again. And if you're interested in uh, learning more how this is done, particularly uh, hands-on, uh, visit our site www.tata.com and, and look into uh, the different opportunities we have for hands-on training. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time in this presentation. We just want to let our audience know that coming up, you will see two more poll questions appear on your screen. As before, if you could take the time to answer these questions so we can make sure that we're bringing you the best content possible, we would really appreciate it. We also want to let our audience know that today's webcast is available for on-demand viewing through March of 2016. And they'll be receiving an email from LabRoots alerting when this webcast is available for replay. And we would love you to form that, forward that announcement to your colleagues if they were not able to make today's live event. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you to Douglas Scientific. We'll see you next time.